we are headlining this program with a conversation, a conversation with, as the proverb from China recommends, one good general. Get ready for a strategic discussion of America's challenges around the globe, really around the world, led by General David Petraeus, who will be in conversation with Max Boot, the noted uh, military historian and also a good friend of Intelligence Squared US, whose upcoming book is called The Road Not Taken, Edward Lansdale and the American Tragedy in Vietnam. Please welcome David Petraeus and Max Boot. <laughs> Hi, Max. General, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, you have 30 minutes for this fascinating conversation. I will be back when the clock runs out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Max, it really is a privilege to be, be here with you on him. stage <laughs> once again. Congratulations on the new book. Well, I was just going to very briefly say that, you know, General Petraeus is really one of the people I admire most in the world. And I think, you know, out of all of the Americans who have served in uniform and, and served so valiantly, I think very few have managed to combine uh, the, the technical side of warfare tactics and operations with a broader grand strategy and diplomacy and, and communications and all those other higher elements of command. And I think really nobody in an American uniform has done that better uh, since the days of Dwight D. Eisenhower than the man who I am privileged to, uh, to interview you. here tonight. It was a privilege. Thank you. Okay. So with that, let's, let's jump into our conversation. The topic here tonight is China, but before we get to China, I'm going to ask uh, General Petraeus a few questions about the broader foreign policy world, starting with the most obvious question in the universe, which is, what do you think about the, the Trump foreign policy? And is there a distinctive uh, Trump policy? Is there a distinctive Trump doctrine? Well, I think it's still emerging, obviously. Uh, and you have to keep in mind that in the United States, the foreign policy is made, not just contributed or influenced by, but made not just by the president and the executive branch, uh, un but unlike a parliamentary system, the legislative branch here really can affect it. And you saw that with the sanctions on Russia, which the president really didn't want, but did sign uh, ultimately. Um, so you, what you're seeing is for six months, and perhaps interesting to some, I would contend that we're, you would characterize this more as continuity than change, with three specific uh, exceptions to that, again, possibly, because it's still emerging, and then one quite significant one. Uh, but let's just review, you know, he, he criticized the relationship with China, uh, took a call from the Taiwanese president, first time in decades, tweeted about it afterwards, uh, and then ultimately, called President Xi, embraced the One China policy, had the Mar-a-Lago summit, and is engaged in fairly st uh, strategic dialogue between several different groups that were established as an outcome of that. Uh, he sort of said, well, one state, two state, whatever they want, eh, when P President Netanyahu was sitting next to him in the Oval Office the next day, uh, Ambassador Haley says this, the policy of the United States is the two-state solution. And again, you've had this on and on with, uh, you know, the Iran nuclear agreement has grudgingly perhaps, but has continued to certify that. We'll see what happens in the next round. But you can go down issue after issue, NATO, uh, whatever, critical at times during the campaign, not unlike some other candidates and some other campaigns, but perhaps a bit more so here, but ultimately coming back to the norm with the exception of trade, of course, pulling out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a very, very big deal, as Joe Biden might have said. Um, and then also uh, with immigration, perhaps uh, there is, we, you know, you had the Mexican ban certainly softened, halted by the courts. We'll see if there's any lasting implication of that, whether there really is a limitation on the number of immigrants that can come in, what happens with H-1B visa, what happens with uh, unskilled labor, still to be, be seen. And by the way, back to trade, NAFTA, the, the negotiations are going on, and I think quite a sensible uh, way so far. Um, and then finally, uh, you also have one other issue, and that's climate, uh, pulled out of the Paris Accord, uh, or will pull out in 2020. Uh, that is very significant symbolically that the United States will not continue to exercise leadership in the world on a very important issue, uh, but substantively probably not a huge difference. Uh, the, uh, what we committed to, frankly, was quite achievable. It's part of, you know, every country was able to design its own commitment. 
And frankly, it's going to be achieved because of businesses, because of states, and because of local communities that realize that this is the smart thing to do as well as the right thing to do. There is one big issue that I think actually is, again, still emerging, and that is the seeming ambivalence at times uh, from the president, uh, but sometimes also not, uh, about whether or not to have the U.S. continue to lead the rules-based international system that we helped bring into existence in the wake of a 50-year period that included two ruinous world wars and the Great Depression. That system, frankly, for all of its shortcomings, the international organizations, the, uh, the Bretton Woods financial institutions and all the rest, lots to criticize, lots to complain about, but generally has served the world uh, pretty good, pretty well in, in the intervening period. Um, and in fact, it has not only just helped us and our allies and partners, it's actually helped China. If arguably, no country has benefited more from it because no country has ever achieved what China did over a two-decade period of double-digit GDP growth year on year, every year in that roughly 20-year period with maybe one exception. So ag again, I think still very much emerging, that last issue that I talked about is a very, very big deal. Uh, and that's, we'll have to see. That's a big exception to the trend of continuity, it, potentially. It is, except that you have uh, McMaster and, uh, and Cohen uh, writing op-eds saying that the U.S. will continue to lead. You have advisors all around him who very much are continued, uh, committed to continue to lead. And so we'll have to see again how this does evolve. Uh, the president, I think, has shown a commendable willingness uh, to, to acknowledge that he was... Uh, unfavorable towards certain recommendations, but ultimately over time, as most recently with the Afghanistan policy, I think it's been quite good, frankly, on the ISIS uh, and anti-extremist uh, uh, endeavor. Uh, the Syrians, Bashar al-Assad's forces used chemical weapons on his people, and you know, there's no, no ambivalence there. 36 hours later, 50 cruise missiles hit, hit the air base from which those were launched. Um, so again, uh, some areas of change, one potentially very significant one, depending on how it evolves. But actually, if you tick down all of the different issues, probably more continuity than change. What do you think is the impact abroad of some of the president's, let's say, unusual behavior at home? And I'm thinking, you know, the, the kind of uninhibited tweeting, the attacks on the press, which he calls the enemy of the American people the hesitation to condemn white supremacists, the pardon of Sheriff Arpaio, some of the, these other things that caused so much controversy at home. What impact, if any, does that have abroad on the U.S. role? Well, it, obviously, it, it causes people to, to question, uh, again, consistency, commitment to values that we have long promoted for the rest of the world uh, and the rest of this, keeping in mind that this is a president who truly actually believes in doing what he wrote in his book, uh, about doing, which is before you negotiate with somebody else, you punch the other guy in the nose before you even sit down, and who sees value in, in some cases, a lack of consistency, uh, who wants the other side off balance. So, and there is some merit to this. You can actually argue, perhaps you can argue that, that, that there's some merit to that in business. You can argue, perhaps there's some merit uh, to it in international relations, although it obviously can go too far. My concern there with the so-called, you know, there's this madman theory that actually Nixon put forward through Kissinger, where he had Kissinger tell the Soviets, you know, Nixon's under a lot of pressure right now, and you know, he drinks at night sometimes, so you guys ought to be real careful. Yeah, Nixon, don't, Nixon thought don't, that, don't, Nixon thought don't that push the madman, this into a crisis. I mean, Nixon thought the madman theory would scare North Vietnam into making peace, and it did not work. Yeah, and, and what I was about to say is that there may again be some merit into the madman theory until you get in a crisis. But you do not want the other side thinking you, you are irrational in a crisis. This is called crisis instability uh, as opposed to pre-crisis uh, situations. You do not want the other side thinking that you might be sufficiently uh, irrational t to conduct a first strike or to do something, you know, the so-called unthinkable. So again, there are some benefits to some of this. There are certainly some drawbacks as well. And I think consistency in messaging uh, has not uh, been a distinguishing feature so far. In fact, there's been a little bit of message discipline issue from time to time. Nicely understated. Um, <laughs> I mean, it does seem like uh, the president believes 
uh, in basically the art of the bluff. I mean, he, he's, no, no he says a lot it. of things yeah. that are kind of over the top. Yep. We're going to rain fire and fury yep. on North Korea and so forth. Yep. And I guess the issue is whether that's helpful or ultimately it's going to yep. undermine our credibility. That's exactly right. And then also in individual relationships. Um, you know, how far can you push somebody else? You, you Again, perhaps his work to some degree in his career, apparently. Uh, again, it's something he wrote about, and he, he does believe in doing it. And again, there are some arguments that can be made for some of this. The question is, when do you do something that is non-biodegradable, as we used to say, in a personal relationship with another leader? And by the way, he has been very assiduous in reaching out to, to he loves working the phones. Uh, and there's some merit in that. If you're the President of the United States, and you're willing to call a lot of these different leaders around the world, uh, I can tell you I've seen different situations. I've served presidents from both parties. I'm truly apolitical, don't vote. Uh, I've been confirmed in political appointee positions, or at least confirmed in positions uh, under presidents of both parties. What do you think about the fact that, you know, in a, this is truly unprecedented, that we've actually been able to read the transcripts of some of his phone calls with the Prime Minister of Australia or the uh, President of the Philippines? I mean, certainly the amount of information we're getting, a lot of which is... Is, is not very it's flattering a, the, to him. The, is, the is, ship of state is leaky, yes. although I think with uh, General Kelly there that there has already been a notab notable uh, level of discipline to processes to, again, consistency of message, message discipline, if you will, uh, and a variety of other uh, activities in the White House. There's been some concern raised, including by some former military folks, about how many retired generals are in such prominent positions in this administration, including, of course, Jim Mattis at Defense, H.R. McMaster at the NSC, uh, John Kelly as, as White House Chief of Staff. I mean, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Depends on the generals. Uh, and the truth is that we have seen this over time. We've had generals who have been secretaries of state, some of them pretty exceptional, like George C. Marshall. Um, we've had some others that didn't uh, last a full term. Uh, in fact, maybe lasted a year or so. The same with national security advisors, some great ones, Brent Scowcroft would come to mind, uh, and then some others that, again, have moved through the revolving door pretty rapidly. I think the key is to recognize that this generation of general officers, and look, every single one of them, you know, we served together on the battlefield. Many of them worked directly for me, H.R. McMaster and his deputy, Ricky Waddell, who is not only a Rhodes Scholar, top of his class from West Point, Columbia PhD, and successful businessman, but a major general in the U.S. Army Reserve, and we brought him on active duty in Iraq and Afghanistan. These generals know that every problem out there is not a nail, and you just can't find a bigger hammer. In fact, you generally need a stiletto and a comprehensive approach. Uh, among the many lessons of the last 15 years, which I'd like to recount very, very quickly, uh, is one that requires a comprehensive approach. The, this is a fighting Islamist extremists. I think there's five lessons we should have learned. Uh, one is uh, that ungoverned spaces in the Muslim world will be exploited by extremists. The second is uh, you have to do something about it because Las Vegas rules don't apply in these areas. What happens there does not stay there. Uh, the third is that in doing something, the U.S. has to lead because we uniquely have the assets that are proving to be revolutionary in enabling us to fight extremists using other countries' troops on the front lines, we are advising and assisting others in enabling with this armada of unmanned aerial vehicles that, that a bunch of commanders in Iraq and Afghanistan and I very much sought more of through Secretary Gates, who is very supportive. And we now have those, and they're extraordinary. But it's not just the platform, by the way. It's the 150 per people per each of the predators and reapers in the Air Force that make them so capable. The industrial strength fusion of intelligence, hugely important, and then the precision strike assets. The fourth is that in taking action, you have to recognize the paradox that you cannot counter terrorists like the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda with just counter terrorist force operations. You can't just drone strike or Delta Force raid your way out of this problem. It takes a comprehensive approach. And that's what these generals very much know. It takes all of the above, not just military, but, but diplomatic and development and homeland security folks for a whole variety of different tasks. Again, the FBI, the intelligence community, all of these have to be pulled together for a comprehensive approach. As you know well, the surge in Iraq that mattered most was the surge of ideas, the change in strategy. It was how are we going to squeeze the life out of uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq and the Sunni insurgents? And we did it with everything, including 
pol political uh, initiatives, reconciliation, uh, rule of law, uh, hearts and minds, but also more bombs and more raids uh, than before as well. It takes all of that. These generals know that. The fifth one, by the way, is pretty important. That is that we are engaged in a generational struggle, and that means not something going to be solved in a year or even a decade. It's going to require a sustained commitment, and in view of that, it has to be a sustainable, sustained commitment. And I think we are actually proving to be able to do some of that by the use uh, of these different assets that I mentioned. And that is, again, quite a revolutionary development. Well, given the emphasis that I think you rightly put on non-military lines of operations, how concerned are you about the fact that uh, so many of the uh, posts at the State Department are currently unfilled, that, that, is that we don't have the frontline sure. diplomats no, out that, there? No, I think that's, that's a big concern. Again, we've got a difference out, quite a significant difference, as an example, between the Saudis and the Emiratis on one side and the Qataris on the other. Um, who's our Assistant Secretary of State for the Near East? Actually, he's not, he's an acting. In fact, he just replaced the guy who was the acting who actually retired from the position. Actually, David Satterfield is now in position, superb diplomat, but he needs to be confirmed. He needs to have the authority that goes along with uh, the position he's in. The same is true of all of these other locations. There are serious differences, obviously, uh, out in the Far East, the challenge of North Korea and its nuclear program, do we have an Assistant Secretary of State for, for the Far East? No, we do not. Again, an acting, and they're doing what they can, but again, it carries much more weight if the Senate has actually confirmed your appointment, if you've actually been nominated and they know you're going to be in that job for some period of time. So I know there's a push on to do that now. Uh, they did the look at, you know, how can we uh, save resources and all the rest, and certainly, there, I mean, any serving ambassador would tell you there's a lot that can be done to achieve efficiency, but some of these central positions, I don't care what reform you have, they need to be filled and they will remain in position. So yes, we need to get on with that. All right, let's segue to the Far East. And yeah. uh, let me ask you uh, kind of a very broad question, which is, uh, which country do you think is gonna be more powerful in the 21st century, China or India? Well, as you know, a good former economics professor, uh, I would have to say it depends. Um, and what it depends on, certainly, you know, the bet would be on China in the near term. I mean, they've done something truly revolutionary. No other country ever achieved the, the level of economic growth. That model appears to continue to work, although it doesn't quite get the same bang for the buck with infrastructure investment that drove GDP because you've done so much of it. Uh, moving from the country to the city, a little bit more difficult if you, if you don't have all the additional jobs for unskilled labor. Uh, some of the other initiatives that they have had, but really, uh, you know, there was a great headline to an analytical piece I saw some months ago, and it said, China's great problems, dot, 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 and China's great leaders. Now, don't mistake me. Uh, there, there's some legitimate uh, differences that we might have about the state of various freedoms, uh, the economic system, even the, the uh, political system, and the ability of people to choose their own leaders or not. Uh, but the fact is that they have done something that is absolutely extraordinary, and that's going to carry them all the way through the midterm without question. At some point, India is going to rise. It may be beginning now with the Modi reforms. This may be the Modi moment that has arrived right now. They've done the goods and services tax, which is a very significant reform of how they do business between their own states. Uh, you earlier demonetized the economy. Uh, it, it, you know, just an incredible action. And by the way, he survived it politically. In fact, he did even better in the state of Gujarat, his own. He, they prevailed uh, very significantly. So he is riding quite a wave. It's a you know, very famously fractious, difficult bureaucracy. Uh, but that has great potential if they can get that momentum. And it's interesting to see them now working with Japan, as we mentioned backstage, because, of course, of the mutual concern uh, about the rise of China. Well, one obvious and vast difference between India and China is that India is a democracy, China is not. How significant do you think that is? Has that been an advantage or disadvantage for China, and, and what is it going to be going forward? Again, keep in mind that the system that China has is somewhat unique in the sense that for an authoritarian system, which at the end of the day I think they would even acknowledge it is, they have nonetheless had change of leadership on a schedule. It's, and it's been peaceful, it's been 
consensual by and large. Certainly there are moves to consolidate power. Uh, I think President Xi has been particularly impressive uh, in, in doing that. Uh, the party Congress is coming up. We'll see if they continue to go along with the scheduled transition that would take place at the end of his 10 years, uh, or whether there is some maneuver or mechanism or whatever to, again, to prolong his time uh, as the president. Um, but at the end of the day, their system has worked exceedingly well. By the way, I was just back up at the Department of Social Sciences where I taught when I was uh, in, in uniform for a period of time. At West, and Point. at West Point. Um, and it, is there any other Department of Social Sciences <laughs> place? I hear there might I be mean, a couple out there maybe, somewhere. Yeah. Maybe Princeton, you know, I mean, um, and thank God for Harvard. I mean, everybody can't get into Princeton, so. Um, <laughs> I think there should be a resurrection of the study of comparative politics. You know, that course went away. I mean, we won. 1991, the wall came down. We turned the second largest army in the world into the fifth largest overnight into Operation Desert Storm, and we stood on top of that hill. Uh, and that, we stayed, we retained that position for a good 25 or more years until gradually we have seen the return of great power rivalries, or what, what uh, Ian Bremmer talks about, the G0 uh, world, where you don't have this one colossus uh, astride the globe the way we were, preeminent economically, politically with our system and clearly uh, militarily. And now that is all being challenged uh, to varying degrees. And again, I think it is worth studying the Chinese system. I'm not advocating adopting it, but I can assure you there's a lot of other countries around the world that are studying it and saying, you know, maybe this is not all that bad. Um, and You're probably looking better all the time with the domestic chaos that we have in this country. <laughs> I would remind the audience, as always, that you know our country's been through a little bit of adversity before. There have That's been true. some sectarian or some, some, some very, very partisan times, if you will. Uh, I mean, the Civil War was, after all, a four-year endeavor. That was a bit of uh, fought between there, yes. North and South. I mean, let's not forget that not too far. From, well, I guess it wasn't too far from here. The sitting Vice President of the United States shot and killed the first Secretary of the Treasury. So. We've been through some tough periods before. Uh, I think it is a strength of our country. And actually, you can chronicle many others, as you well know. Uh, and uh, again, out of this, inevitably, uh, is validation of Churchill's observation that uh, you can always count on the Americans to get it right after you know doing everything wrong. So we'll see, or words to, that, all the words to that right. <laughs> effect. Do you think that the, I mean, you've been fairly bullish on China. Do you think that the 21st century is destined to be the Chinese century? Are they going to overtake us and become the dominant power? Well, I think inevitably they're going, you know, a, a country of 1.3 billion people inevitably will have a larger economy than we do. Their per capita income may still be one seventh or so. Of, I mean, there's a real question actually, does China get rich before it gets old the way Japan did? or does it get old before it gets rich? Because again, their per capita income is still uh, vastly lower uh, than ours. Um, but clearly that economy is going to surpass ours at some point. It may not come quite so soon to a theater near us, uh, as they say, but we'll see. Uh, by the way, in real, real terms, in dollar, uh, real terms, in nominal growth, in each of the last three years, I believe it is, the US actually outgrew China. Now some of that is obviously because of currency fluctuations it's going back the other way this year. Um, the political system, again, this is a renewal of great power rivalries. Uh, and there will be comparisons of our two systems, and there certainly will be cases of countries that are either bandwagoning with or, uh, again, uh, balancing against China in the balancing category, perhaps, with us. By the way, let's make very clear that China is our number one trading partner. But they'd also acknowledge it's also our number one strategic rival. I would contend, by the way, as you know, in the title of the course that I taught for three and a half years at the City University of New York Honors College was the North American Decades, which I would still contend is where we are right now. But those are probably coming to an end unless we can really uh, get our GDP growth uh, substantially higher uh, in the next few years. Um, Will they top us militarily? Look, that is it going to be a, a pretty steep climb. They spend one quarter of what we spend right now or less. Uh, you take 
all of the aircraft carriers of the world and flat deck amphibs, and we have more of them than all the rest of the world together. It's not to say they don't have near-peer capabilities in space, in cyberspace, certainly, uh, in area anti-access, area denial capabilities in the South and East China Sea, uh, uh, their air forces, a lot of rapid improvement, and very much on the cutting edge of technology. I mean, those people that set a closed society, a society which is cutting off now the VPN access to the internet and so forth can innovate, have obviously never been to Hangzhou uh, and, and uh, seen Alibaba or been in Beijing with Xiaomi or Baidu or some of these others. These are serious innovators uh, and we should never get complacent about that. And of course they don't have to overtake us across the entire globe because we have a global military. All they're concerned about is regional predominance. Well, regional predominance right now, but already um, the Belt and Road strategy includes uh, the string of pearls, as they're called. These are the ports that go from Southeast Asia all the way across, yeah. uh, all the way now to Djibouti in Africa uh, and, and others. They don't do underway provisioning yet. They're not that kind of deployable uh, naval maritime expeditionary force, but they're getting there. And again, first aircraft carrier, yes, it's a hand-me-down, um, yes, it broke down, I think, in its maiden voyage, but the second keel is already laid, and they're, gonna, they're going to do that. By the way, anybody who has not seen the video uh, of a bridge being erected in China within a 24-hour period, and I see some nods in the audience, it is unbelievable. It's 41 hours? Incredible to watch this. Uh, and contrast that, actually, I was just up at Harvard on Monday, contrast that with that bridge that connects Harvard main campus with the Harvard Business School, which I tell you is almost done. I think there's just a few orange cones well, left, but it's been there for five years or so. Well, I will, I will say one thing on, on behalf of the U.S., just based on a personal observation, because I happened to land a few weeks ago on the USS Nimitz in the Persian Gulf, and it was just such an amazing experience. And not it's unbelievable. Not just for the technology, yep. which, of course, is awe-inspiring, but yep. what r really struck me was talking to the crewmen, 4,800 personnel yep. aboard that ship, and the incredible know-how and skills they have to keep this little airport going in it's the middle of the water with these yep. planes taking off and landing where there's yep. always a high risk of disaster, but they do yep. it safely time and again. And it just seems like this is a skill set and a knowledge base that the U.S. Navy has developed over decades where the Chinese can certainly build the aircraft carriers yep. much harder to replicate the knowledge that makes them run. This is a generational task yeah. to build maritime aviation capability. And you should do it in an F and A eighteen. I assume you were in the propeller thing the that car, sort of yes. drifted down yes. instead of the what a manly yes. way of slamming into yeah. the deck with it the. It was still like a roller coaster forward. ride, though. It is quite a roller coaster yes. ride. Uh, it, it is extraordinary what we do have, and of course the Chinese are very keenly aware that they have had no real combat experience, and any of our leaders have had numerous tours uh, in combat, albeit not against peer competitors. But, against, but certainly very fierce and tough combat. What do you think of the, of the Graham Allison thesis? And Graham Allison is the professor yep. at the Harvard Kennedy School who just published a book called mm -hmm. Destined for War in which he suggests that based on his historical study that when you have a rising great power and an existing great power that in more cases than not the result is a conflict. So are we destined for war with China? I don't think so, uh, but we certainly ought to take steps to prevent that. Uh, some of those steps should be to maintain and in, indeed improve uh, our capability and our military readiness and all the rest of that f as a deterrent force and to exercise it and ensure that there's no ambiguity about uh, understanding of our capabilities, but also strategic dialogue. I'm very much from the Henry Kissinger School believing that it really does pay to sit down with a very significant high-level interlocutor, uh, one from our side, one from theirs, develop uh, at trust in each other, even if, again, the objectives are, can, may be diametrically opposed in some cases, but, but common objectives in other. Understanding their red lines, they understand ours, uh, and again, you have that level of communication. Look, we're in a different age from any of those case studies that Graham Allison's book studies, uh, which note that I think it's three quarters of the time that you have a rising power and an established power, Sparta and Athens, uh, that ultimately, as uh, they chronicled in the Peloponnesian Wars, Thucydides wrote, and inevitably they went to war, yeah. as if this is an inevitability. Look, we're in a nuclear age, 
and war as an inevitability, I think, should give us all a great deal of pause. We're running low on time. Let me just ask you a question that's much in the news, which is North Korea and the relationship to China. Is China going to help solve North Korea for us, or are they an obstacle in, in the way of solving it, meaning, i.e., lessening the danger from North Korea's nuclear and ballistic missile programs, which combined are going to put American cities at risk very shortly? Yeah, look, I mean, they, they obviously have to be part of the solution. And all of the efforts of South Korea, Japan, by the way, I was in Tokyo the day that we had the missile fly over. Uh, it was our first day over there. I thought it was welcome back to the Far East, General Petraeus. Um, or a salute, you know, is the flyover. 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 Um, look, they have to be part of the solution. And again, those two countries and the United States and other countries that are involved in that region are all... Uh, in the process of taking steps to both defend uh, more effectively against possible threats from North Korea, but also to send signals to China uh, that this really is serious and we really do need them to enforce the sanctions. And we're going to have to do the same thing with Russia because that can be a sanctions buster or a workaround uh, for some of those uh, items that China will prevent from going into their country, such as coal, perhaps textiles now, some petroleum products. So this, uh, again, this is the threat of the day. Uh, I, I think it's valid for the uh, administration to look at this differently than any other administration because on his watch, uh, a madman, who I don't think is suicidal, but, but some may, uh, will have a capability to hold at risk an American city, at least on the West Coast and maybe all the way into the Midwest of the United States. And the size of that last... Uh, explosion, the, the nuclear test, was now it may have been as much as 20 times the size of uh, the Hiroshima bomb. Uh, earlier it was assessed to be 8 to 10 times. They're revising that upward. Uh, that's a very scary prospect. Uh, and again, we're going to have to bring everything to bear uh, to get China to realize that it's in their interest uh, to force him to come to the table. And when there were really effective sanctions in the past, at one point in time, they did come to the table. Sanctions do work. We saw Iran come to the table as well because of sanctions. They came to the table, but we'll didn't necessarily keep their commitments.